Moving traffic through the network is something we should all be interested in. Routing is arguably one of the most important considerations for a network engineer. In this and the following two videos, we're going to get an understanding of how routers forward traffic and how to configure routing. The whole point of routers is to route or forward traffic from one network to another. Sometimes packets have to be forwarded across many networks before they reach their destination. I say routers, but these days many switches are also capable of routing packets. They are called layer 3 switches or multi-layer switches, and as the name suggests, they're good for both routing and switching. Layer 3 switches are especially good for routing traffic between VLANs, while routers are often used when connecting to the internet or for WAN connections. In these videos, I'm just going to continue using the term router, but be aware that the principles can apply to layer 3 switches as well. Each router in the network will need to make its own decisions about how a packet should be forwarded. But before they can do this, they need to learn about paths through the network. They don't just magically know where everything is. As an example, if we open router R5 and try to ping an IP in a different network, we can see that it fails. To start with, they will know about any network they're directly connected to. These networks will be added to the routing table, which we can see with Show IP Route. All Layer 3 devices will have a routing table, although they may look different depending on the vendor. Here we can see a list of networks with a code on the left. Anything with a C code is a directly connected network. If you forget what a particular code means, you can always look at the handy reference at the top. Next to the code is the network itself. The first part is the prefix, and the second part is the subnet mask, shown inside a notation. The information just to the right of that tells us that our router is directly connected to this network, and it tells us which interface is used. The other type of route we can see here is called a local route, which has an L code. These represent the router's IP addresses within the connected network. That means that there is one local route per connected route. Can you also see that each local route has a slash 32 mask? Subnet masks are 32 bits long, so a slash 32 mask has every bit turned on. So this refers to a single host. In the routing table, this is called a host route, as it is pointing to a single host rather than an entire network. Connected and local routes will appear in the routing table automatically, when an active interface is configured with an IP address. You might also notice that the routing table has sections that are listed as either subnetted or variably subnetted. This goes back to the classful networking days. All this means is that the subnetted network is part of a larger classful network. To be honest, I don't really think about these things that much. Uh, as I've said in some other videos, there's not a lot of reason to think in terms of classes anymore. That's quite a bit to cover in a very short time. So if you want, test whether this is making sense by trying out these questions. If we want a router to reach other networks, that is networks that aren't connected, we can configure a static route to point the way. Here's the anatomy of a static route. It includes the destination network that we want to reach. This may be a nearby network or it could be some distance away. The subnet mask of the remote network the next hop IP that we forward packets to. The next hop IP in most cases will be the IP address of another router in a network that our router is directly connected to. For example, router R5 may use the IP address of R3 as a next hop, as they both have interfaces in the 172.16.0.0 network. Maybe it's easier to see this in action. Let's configure R5 with a route so we can reach the 192.168.3.0 network. We use the IP route command, add in 192.168.3.0, give it the subnet mask of 255.255.255.0, and finally the next hop IP is 172.16.0.3. We're not limited to just one static route, of course. We can create many more. For example, a route to 172.16.36.0. Now let's take a look at that routing table again. 
see how there are now two new routes listed. They have an S code, which refers to a static route. A static route is one that we configure manually. The entry for a static route looks different to the connected and local routes. Next to the network and mask, we have the numbers 1 slash 0 in square brackets, and I'll explain that one a little bit later. Further to the right, we have the IP address of the next hop. This is the IP that the router will forward packets to if it needs to send them to this network. I have a few good labs at the end of this video too that you can try this on uh, if you want to. What do you think will happen to a static route if a link fails? We're going to simulate this in the background by breaking R5's interface to switch 1. If a router no longer has an interface in a network that contains the next hop, then the static route will be removed from the routing table. If we want, we could bypass this behavior and force the route to stay in the routing table no matter what by adding the permanent keyword to the end of the IP route command. This won't magically make the route work though. It will only force the route to stay in the routing table. If we now fix that interface, the route appears back in the routing table once again. Let's take a look at something that you might not have thought of. First, let's ping 192.168.3.3. And that works just as we would expect. That's using one of the routes we configured a few moments ago. When we send a ping, the router selects an IP that it thinks is suitable as the source of this packet. So the ping will be sent from 172.16.05. When R3 needs to respond, it will send the response message back to 172.16.05. We can change this behavior by adding the source keyword. This changes the source IP that our router uses when sending the ping message. And this fails. Do you know why? Do you remember earlier that I said that each router needs to make its own routing decisions? When R3 gets the ping, it will need to look at its routing table to decide how to send a response back to 172.16.205. However, right now, R3 does not have a route back to 172.16.205. The key takeaway here is that when we think about routing, we need to think about how to get traffic to its destination, as well as how the destination router can send traffic back. So how do we fix this? We can add a new route to R3. This route goes to the 172.16.200 network using R5 as the next hop. If we go back to R5 and try that ping again, we can see that it is now working. Let's consider another scenario. We have seen that a static route will be removed from the routing table if a critical interface fails. What happens if something else along the path breaks, but the interface stays up? Let's simulate this by shutting down an interface on R3. As you would expect, the static route on R3 is removed from R3's routing table. What do you think will happen on R5? R5 is not physically connected to R3, it's connected to a switch. So while R3's interface is shut down, R5's will stay up. As R5's interface is still up, the static route will remain in the routing table. It won't be able to reach R3 though, so traffic using this route will flow into a black hole. This is a key limitation of static routes. By default, they are not very aware of the state of the network. While we're still talking about static routes, there is an alternative way that we can use them. If we want, we can configure an outgoing interface rather than a next hop IP. In cases like this, the router will use an ARP message to find the IP address of the next hop. This might be used in a case where we have a small network with only two routers in it. For example, like the small network between R1 and R2. Personally, I don't really like using these types of static routes very often. I much prefer using a next hop IP address, but you need to be aware that sometimes you will see them out there. I've already mentioned a few times that each router will make its own decisions about how to handle and forward packets. Let's take a little time to think about how it will make these decisions and how packets flow through the network. To start with, a host connected to the network will create a packet. If this needs to go to any network that it is not a part of, it will send the packet to its default gateway. Once the packet arrives at the router, 
the router needs to decide what to do. Technically at this point it is a frame, not a packet, as it will still have a layer 2 header, probably Ethernet. So the first router will check to see if the frame is valid or corrupt. If it is corrupt, it will be discarded. If it's fine, it will decapsulate the frame, leaving a packet. It can now retrieve the destination IP address in the IP header and compare it to routes in the routing table. If there is a route, the router will prepare to forward the packet to the next hop. This includes getting the MAC address of the next hop and encapsulating the packet with new Ethernet headers and trailers. If there is no suitable route in the routing table, the router will drop the packet. Keep in mind though that the router will not check if the next hop is up. If the next hop does not exist, the packet will be dropped. And if you want to test yourself out, here are a few more quiz questions you can try. So, hosts have a default gateway. Guess what? Routers do too. If a router does not have a route to a particular destination, it can use its default route. It's kind of a catch-all route that's used if nothing better can be found. The best example of when this is used is for your internet connection. In most networks, you can't reasonably be expected to have a route for every possible destination on the internet. So for this, you will have a default route. We can still configure this like any other route though. The difference is that the destination network is 0.0.0.0. .0, .0, .0 with a subnet mask of 0.0.0.0. This will match everything, assuming that there's nothing more specific, of course. When we look at the routing table, we see this in two places. For one, it will show up as a regular route. The only difference is the star symbol. The star symbol means candidate default. You can have more than one default route configured if you want to, but the router will only use one at a time. So the candidate default is the one that the router is using right now. We also see this listed as the gateway of last resort. This is also the default route that is currently in use. Is a default route only for internet access? No, we can use this in other cases too. Look at R6 in this topology. There is only one way in and one way out, and that is the path through R3. When configuring routing on R6, we could create separate routes for all the networks in our topology, but that will take a fair bit of effort. So instead, why not just configure R6 with a default route using R3 as the next hop? It catches all traffic anyway, which we can see with the ping. This is a type of summary route. We're making life easier by combining several routes into one simplified route. The best way to lock all this in your brain is to practice. So I have two challenges for you. Firstly, start by building this topology. For the networks around the edges, I recommend using loopback interfaces. Our members have it easier as you can download the starting topology from the website. Next, configure static routing on all routers so every router can reach every other network. You can test it out with a ping, remembering to change your source IP on occasion. If you are willing to download labs from the site, I have an additional challenge for you. I have configured the topology, but it's broken. You need to use the skills that you've learned in this video to try to repair the network so that all the routers can reach all the other networks once again. This lab is the one that will probably give you the most benefit. If you can, try to practice the skills you've learned here. There really is no substitute for practice. Also, consider going back to videos 12 and 13 where we talked about VLANs and router on a stick. See if you can figure out how the router on a stick configuration works and how packets are forwarded between VLANs. In the next video, we begin discussing dynamic routing, so I hope to see you there.